uh, welcome back to uh, to all of you. It's my pleasure to uh, to host and moderate the uh, the next two panels. The first one being the business panel, because now we're going to turn to the business side of things. We're going to look at uh, how do we refocus, how do we rejuvenate, and how do we reinvent in this kind of post-pandemic world. So we're not going to spend too much time on what is still undergoing, but hopefully there's also some light uh, at the end of the uh, the tunnel here. So I'm very delighted to uh, to welcome uh, three distinguished uh, business people from the uh, uh, world of family business, being uh, Caroline uh, Herlein, former CEO and currently a shareholder and member of the advisory board of Caroline Hütte in uh, Germany. We have uh, Ho Kan Ping, founder chairman of uh, Banyan Tree Holdings and also of Singapore Management University. And then we got uh, Diron Van Echen, he's the CEO from uh, Van Echen in uh, Holland a very old uh, company in the world of family business. So warm welcome to, uh, to all of you. I think we get you on, on video, all the three of you, as we get started here. And while we are getting uh, our three panelists on video, I would also encourage the audience to, uh, to ask uh, questions through the Q&A button. We have actually gotten a fair deal of questions already, but I would encourage you to, to, to keep it going uh, as we speak. So uh, Caroline, KP Quan Ping, I refer to you as a KP, my good friend, and also Diron, or KP calling in from Thailand. We got Caroline in Germany, we got Diron in Amsterdam, and myself calling out of the, uh, the rural countryside of uh, Denmark. So very nice to, to see all of you. The way we're gonna do that, uh, we're just gonna hear a, a, a brief introduction from, from each of you, the family, the family firm that you represent, what you do and your current role, and then we'll head into a discussion about the, the kind of the future forward issues. If I may start with you, Caroline. Caroline, yourself, your role, what's happening? Welcome, Caroline. Oh, good morning and good afternoon to everyone. So my name is Caroline Hörlein, and I'm fifth generation in an iron foundry in southern Germany. Um, the company has been in my family since 1885. And as you said, Martin, it's called Karolinenhütte. So I am the eldest daughter, and I was also named after, after the company. And um, we specialize in the production of complex hand molded prototypes and small series made out of, of iron. So this is typical old economy, uh, as you would call it. Um, our business is 100% project based with, with the prototypes and it comprises a vast uh, variety of, of different products. So our castings, our end products weigh between two kilos and up to nine tons. So, so that means the way we work, no production day is, is like the other since we have so many different products. And so flexibility and speed, time to market is our, our USPs uh, and our, our key requirements also from our customers, right? And so our typical products would be turbine wheels, pumps and compressor housing, engine blocks, and the industries would be the, the turbine construction, machine tool, machinery, and, and general engineering industries. So that's a little bit the background of the company. Uh, when it comes to me, I'm the, the eldest one of, of three children. And in my, in my early 20s, I opted not to join the company. I was in New York at that point. And uh, as our father sat us down, my younger brother decided that he would like to step in and uh, take over the company in fifth generation. And our succession plan was unfortunately changed in 2011 when my, my father passed away unexpectedly. Um, and as my brother at that point was only 25, I decided to leave my current job, step in the company and, and join Karolinen Hütte. And I thought it would only be an assignment for six to 12 months and then I'm off again and everyone is settled in. But it turned out to be a six year adventure as a CEO of, of our company because I took it over in a very bad economic shape. And I, for me, the, the, those six years, I needed to restructure and refocus the company and actually turn it around in order to pass it on to my brother. So I left the company in 2007 as a CEO in my operational role. My brother is still running the company and uh, I'm still shareholder and member of the advisory board. So I'm still very close to the company, uh, but now in a more strategic role. So I'm looking forward to, to the discussions to come. Fantastic, Caroline. Uh, welcome to the panel. And I mean, what a, what a fascinating uh, story with so many facets. We're going to dive into that uh, in a minute. Uh, I'll turn to, uh, to KP, based out of where uh, you are in Thailand right now. So uh, KP, welcome to, the, welcome to the panel. 
Uh, thank you. Thank you, Martin. My name is Ho Kwan Ping. And um, incidentally, I, I have a good relationship with INSEAD. Um, I was an aspiring academic at one time. I was actually offered a job uh, by Henry Claude Etienne, the founder of the Euro Asia Center, way back in the 1980s when they were sufficiently desperate enough to offer me a, a research fellowship. But being in a business family, my father had a stroke. So that was the end of my academic career. And for many years, I had no touch with INSEAD until when I became the founding chairman of Singapore Management University. We hired as one of our longest serving presidents, uh, Arnold De Maia, who was the founding dean of the INSEAD campus. So I have a sort of roundabout association with INSEAD. Um, in, in Singapore Management University, we have something called a business family institute, not a family. I, I use that word carefully because in the Southeast Asian or Asian context, there are a lot of business families that do not necessarily have one single family business that's gone on for a long time, largely because of the very large disruptions in Asian history from colonialism to World War II and so on. And I'm a good example of that. Um, I am a first generation entrepreneur founder of a listed Singapore company called Banyan Tree Holdings, which is a, a resort company with about 50 hotels in 20 odd countries. I started that about 25 years ago. At the same time, uh, my son uh, is the CEO, third generation CEO of another family business my, family, my father started called Taiwa, which is listed in Thailand and is involved in starch based agri-businesses, starch businesses, and so on. And as a family, if you include my grandchildren, as an overall family, we are five generations of a business family because my maternal grandfather started another company involved in mining in the United States of America way back in uh, pre-World War I. So, and, and this, you know, I don't need to go into the companies, but they have morphed over time. Uh, and the important point here, I think, is that while on one hand, you can have a business family that's also tied in with one single family business in other countries, particularly in disrupted countries like in Asia, you can actually have a business family that has gone on for many generations but with different types of family businesses. And the nuance is important here. What it does show is that the, the social cultural dynamics and the values in particular of a business family is perhaps in the Asian context more important than the uh, family business itself, that the, the business family is core to what makes a family business thrive. Fantastic, KP. Welcome to the panel and a, and a very good distinction with uh, with family business versus uh, versus uh, business families. We, we're going to dive into to that aspect as well. Uh, Jerome, welcome to the uh, welcome to the panel and uh, representing, I guess, one of the oldest, at least you're in that league. So uh, welcome. Thank you, uh, Martin. My name is uh, Jeroen van Egen. Uh, our company was established in 1662, so I'm now the 15th generation. Uh, over this long history, um, basically our company has always been active in food, so distributing spices and other food stuff. We had, had in the past also uh, banking activities and shipping activities, um, uh, always diversifying uh, also when there were wars, etc. Um, at the moment, um, we are fully focused on what we call, uh, let's say, the new spices, so vitamins and minerals, basically. We sell uh, healthy ingredients like vitamins and minerals and uh, products based on algae, for example, to the infant formula industry, so to the, uh, to the baby, uh, baby food industry, and to the health supplement industry and to the sports industry. Um, I myself, I'm 42. I live in a tiny village just outside of Amsterdam. I'm CEO since 2012, and I um, became CEO uh, through a selection process within the family. And before that, I had never visited or uh, been in touch with our family company at all. So I can tell more about that later. But uh, um, yeah, since 2012, I'm leading our company, and I love it. And my last haircut I had in November because of Corona. Thank you. Fantastic, uh, Jerome. Uh, thank you for sharing. I'm almost getting a little humble when I hear 15th generation mm -hmm. and counting. I mean, this is just fascinating. So let's get into that. We, we heard the uh, modern Benison in the beginning. Uh, he talked about resilience. 
Um, and it kind of touches on this notion, are family enterprises prices better equipped to uh, to overcome uh, compared to overcome the crisis compared to an institutionalized the, the corporate the public uh, corporate organizations what's your take on that caroline are family businesses better than the public market the institutionalized firms yeah it was mentioned before already and i would fully agree that uh, family businesses are more resilient uh, because they, there's a certain culture of trust and commitment because we, I mean, especially Jerome and I, we are fifth and twelfth generation or 15th generation. So we have this long-term perspective, which, uh, which is often different to publicly traded companies because there are different incentives, right? And so I feel for us, we have this personal relationship and also the, the trust from, from the employees. And I can, I mean, I managed the company through our biggest crisis. I feel that Corona was not our biggest crisis. The crisis was when my, my father passed away. And the trust that I got from the people up front, right, without even working with me beforehand, but just by, by having that name and being part of the family, that was something very special for me. And I think it also helped me to, to manage the crisis back then. And it also helps us now to, to manage the, the Corona pandemic. So, so Katie, I mean, business families, right? Are they uh, are they better to kind of hold together over time compared to the other ones? Or what's your what's your take on it? I think we we should be a bit cautious about saying that family businesses or business families inherently uh, will be more resilient, uh, etc., than than public listed uh, companies. That establishes a sort of fundamental differentiation, which I think might be a false dichotomy. I think the, the point here is one of short-termism versus long-termism in terms of points of view. And I think by and large, um, the, the whole dynamics, particularly of Anglo-American Wall Street type companies are particularly geared towards short-termism. And it is short-termism by itself that I think makes many companies not resilient. The whole motivation, incentive schemes, et cetera, we can go into all that. Uh, much later on, but it's particularly the Anglo uh, the Anglo Saxon model. You have other models, a more Scandinavian model, even the German model, and you've got Japanese and other models, which which are more long term in their view, and not every one of them needs to be a family business. But by the nature of the business family itself, the very nature that if you are have been existing for fifteen generations, that's a very long term view, uh, and you think in terms of generations. That then tends to make you operate with a far longer term view. And you then take, you're much more cautious in your debt. You're much more resilient in terms of dealing with crises and so on. So I think it's the short versus long-term view that is important. And, and if uh, listed companies, dispersed shareholding companies begin to reform themselves after COVID and recognize that they need to restructure themselves so that they're more stakeholder oriented and so on, they can also become as long-term view as family businesses. So in that sense, my short answer is yes, I think by the nature of what we are like as family businesses, we are more resilient, but it doesn't mean it is an exclusive attribute only that only uh, something that family businesses can have. I think it would also be fair here to invite Jerome for a perspective. What, what can you teach a 15 generation business here? You have been around for a long time, Jerome. I mean, succession over time compared to the other types of companies. Are you are you learning from them, or how are you keeping your, I mean, your your firm, of, you know, at the forefront for so many years? Yeah, <laughs> that's a very big uh, question, uh, Martin. Uh, but I think indeed. Uh, uh, one thing which we've uh, you know had always in these 15 generations is had that it was always uh, company and the continuity of the company first uh, and above let's say wealth for family yeah so i think that's one thing with which we've seen always over 15 generation and i think what's also always special in our long history is that we have been um able to adapt of course but we were also not afraid of uh, we have been very big and uh, let's say around 1800 we were very big and around 1900 we were very big but we we've also never been afraid to become smaller again uh, just to stop an entire business and 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 build a whole new business in in, in a more uh, profitable or more uh, uh, in a newer area uh, to build that up again. And that's also basically what we did when I started. Uh, 
uh, let's say 10 years ago, we, we, we sold off, uh, uh, let's say, low margin commodity business. Uh, we decided to build a high margin uh, vitamin business. So we, we, we've never been afraid uh, to, 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 to make these uh, bigger steps of, of, from going bi from big to small. Fantastic. There are a lot of people that talk about that that won't, after this pandemic, be returned to business as usual. It's all about reinvention, uh, integrating next generation leaders uh, into the you know succession planning, doing so much on your strategy, selling off, doing this and that. And, uh, and also uh, uh, Professor Fan has had a very interesting perspective about being conservative and when you should be expansive, right? So is there a return to business as usual? Or what, are, what are your thoughts on, on planning ahead uh, once we get out of the pandemic here? KP, if I may ask you. I, I think this pandemic, like most crises, have accelerated um, already existing trends, whether these, whether these trends be towards digitalization, uh, succession planning, or whatever. So as a accelerant for already existing trends, I think uh, within the context of family businesses, because certain trends like digitalization obviously affects both family businesses as well as you know, non-family businesses. But the more specific issue within family businesses is probably generational succession, which in many countries and in many family businesses is really fraught with tension. And in that respect, probably more fraught with tension than in public companies where the battle for the CEO at the board level is straightforward, brutal and quick and fast. Whereas in family businesses, it's highly emotional. It's got a lot of tensions and a lot of potential for conflicts. Um, I've seen that this pandemic has had one very positive impact. It has brought families a lot closer together. The fragility of the family, the fragility of life itself. And again, the, the value of harmony within a family has been highlighted by the sheer seclusion we've had to face. This sense of fragility, vulnerability, and so on has, I think, allowed much more soul searching by the elders, the patriarchs in the family, like myself, and the young, younger generation in the family, so that there's a much closer coming together of minds and a disappearance of the, of the kind of the shedding away of a lot of egos and other things. And I've seen a uh, generation of succession actually happen better than normally something you would expect as a sort of unexpected uh, plus point of this pandemic, one of their very few plus points. It's almost uh, relates back to Professor Fan that you have to be a little more active and you have to maybe be a little more expansive. At least you had to do something during a recession somehow. Caroline, how, how did it work out for you? You came out of the 2008 crisis and you took on the, the CEO posting in your family firm because of yeah. the, uh, the sad event with your dad. And you were the CEO for a couple of years, now your brothers. And so how, how do you see this back to business as usual? Or has it accelerated? I mean, uh, KP said that it's almost like families are coming together. How has yeah, it worked absolutely. out in your case? We can, we can absolutely see that. And I feel, uh, to Kong Ping's point, I, I feel there are so many topics like re-innovation, transition, that have been on our agenda before. So it's not that we just turn it on now with the, with the pandemic, right? That has been around for, for years now. This is part of our strategy and our long-term thinking, but it has been enhanced now by the, by the crisis and the pandemic. And I feel, at least for, for me and my brother, we became a lot closer, right? Because he's managing the company on a daily basis and he had to manage it through the next crisis. And I guess our, our company and the way we are structured and the, the industry we are in, we are in a very cyclical industry, right? So our company is used to this type of crisis that orders go up and down and uh, we need to be as flexible as possible. But I think in this role now as a, uh, as a board member, it's, it was quite interesting because I got different hats, right? So I'm shareholder, I'm also former CEO, but then I'm also sister, elder sister and coach to my brother. And, and that, was, that got us a lot closer because he managed the, the daily uh, crisis or the, the daily crisis management, but it was, for him, it was very important to have me in the background and have me as a sparing partner more than uh, you, I would say during the, the usual times, right? So for us, it was, a, let's say, a positive experience as a as brother and sister. Renewal can also be, uh, can, can be very hard, right? Because it's about sometimes the hard truth and, you know, cutting off and aligning and telling people off and not doing this, not doing that and, and adding on, of course. So, but 
a lot of that conflict come from either stability and the proven formulas because my granddad used to do it last generation it has worked for a century but you also need to renew yourself innovate disrupt and, and all that so so tyrone how, how would family firms go, go around renewing themselves you've been around for 15 generations here what's this, this balance between how do you mitigate against you know stability what works for you but also daring to bring in the new stuff how do you how do you maintain that balance how does that evolve yeah i i i do think indeed uh, if if we look at the recent um history uh, of our company. Uh, I think previously uh, it has been always, um, let's say father to son, uh, very traditional in that way. Um, if you look now uh, also how, how you saw how the succession has gone, for example, now, uh, let's say in modern times and especially the last time, uh, I think that uh, has, has broken that open. And so, uh, as I explained, uh, we, 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 we did a whole selection process within the family. And I think uh, I almost came in as an outsider. So uh, let's say fresh blood in that, in that sense. Uh, and also uh, our supervisor was also open though to uh, if there were no good candidates within the family, they would have been perfectly fine of getting also somebody externally. Uh, so I think also being open to all options uh, have, has, has, always, um, uh, has, has, has always helped us in, 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 in renewal. So were there any, um, you know, when we get to corporate governance and those structures that you have used them into to allowing your firm to, to last for generations, KP, how have you worked with corporate governance and the, and the structure of the firms? I don't know, you know one family firm and then you know one firm, but what is important in terms of corporate governance and the organizational structure to survive over time? You're asking that of me. I'm only yeah. second, third generation. You should be asking that of Jerome. In fact, one of the things I'd actually wanted to ask of him is, you know, in Asia in particular, uh, the saying that family businesses and, and do not last beyond three generations is absolutely true. Uh, Martin, you know the names of some of the biggest groups in Hong Kong, in the Philippines, and also they don't last very long. One of the takeaways I've had from this, and actually, I'm quite interested to learn from Jerome how to manage this. And, and I've got, I've had to set up, I have set up trust as, as others have. But one of the basic I've learned and discussing with my other friends and family businesses and so on is the problem of the dispersion of ownership over time. I cannot imagine after 15 generations how many hundreds of Van Egan's there are out there all demanding that they be paid a dividend or else. Mm would vote against the company and go and list it or sell it. And so one of the things I've done within our own family trust is to ensure that because uh, we have at this time anyway, relatively few family lines, the family trust is organized along family lines and the voting structures is along family lines. So ultimately you, you would never have, even if, if hopefully my family business will, will last 15 generations, hopefully by that time, if there are a thousand hoes around, um, you're not gonna have a thousand shareholders each clamoring for their right. They will all be fighting for themselves, no doubt. They have their own, they, have, they can clamor, have their own disagreements, but ultimately there will only be three, because I have three children, there will be family trusts. Um, and so the disagreement and the decision-making ultimately will only be at three family lines. But, but that's a decision that has to be made pretty early. Um, and other, other tycoons I've seen have done things like, very common in Asia, give uh, one whole business to one son, give one whole business to another son, daughter's given money and that's about it. And uh, after that, the family business just falls apart. So, I mean, that's my experience. I would like to know how to, how can I last 15 generations? <laughs> It, it, it is interesting. You got the formula. Show it to us, Jerome. You got the formula. Yeah, no, but it, it is indeed interesting because we, we have been reviewing our governance uh, all the time. Uh, so uh, at one stage, uh, let's say from the 1930s up until uh, 2000, um, there was a big family trust, a charity trust, which was holding basically 60% of the shares. Uh, and then there were, let's say, 60 family members who were holding individually the rest. So there was basically one big shareholder, a family trust, uh, and that gave stability. And that helped us a lot uh, in those years. But now we were thinking, yeah, okay, um, this family trust, 
you know, the all the individual shareholders, they don't feel connected to the company anymore because they have nothing to say. Basically, if the board of the trust says, says A, it's going to happen because they have all the vote, voting rights. So in 2012, we decided uh, to change that and that we need a different direction, that we need to attract more shareholders and get more involvement again. So over the last eight years, we, we, we have been promoting buying shares. Uh, even if you want to buy one, uh, we've been uh, uh, promoting to buy shares within the family big time. And now we grew from 60 shareholders individual to 120. And we've been uh, um, minimizing uh, the, the, the voting rights of this, of this trust and trying to attract uh, that people feel connected again to the company and that they have something to say. And we opened up um, a family council to new members and that every family branch uh, can uh, appoint someone from their branch uh, so that they feel indeed more connected. Uh, uh, and it's also the reason why we do it that we uh, we opened up the supervisory board to more family members, uh, these family councils to, uh, to, uh, to more members, also to attract talent maybe for the future so that we can attract cousins. Uh, uh, some cousins I hardly know, but uh, that we make people interested, uh, that we can uh, attract young talent from the family, that they get a little bit already involved in the family. And of, of, of course, I'm still young, but, but still we're already thinking, and uh, maybe uh, I hope I do this until I'm uh, 60, but maybe... In 10 years, we decide, eh, is Jeroen the white person? Maybe we need uh, another person from the family. So we're already yeah. thinking ahead uh, in that way. That's, that's actually a question from the audience. Thanks for that one. It is how, how I mean, how, at, at what early age should you bring the, the younger family members in? Because that goes to your question, Jerome, here, or, or your, your notion here in terms of kind of renewal and getting even a kind of non-participating shareholders along and get people to buy shares. So how young should you get started with the, with the family members? And, and what type of learning should there be? I mean, these are not business people yet, but, but how early does it start to induce that at least understanding that we are a business family, as you refer to, uh, KP? Can, can I respond to that? There the are two aspects of it. And one is, I think, more important than the other. And the one that's more important is what type of learning rather than what age. It happens to be, it just happened that in my, for my own sake, my father's idea of a Sunday outing was to, to take me to his factories. So it started at a very young age. My idea of, uh, of fun is going to visit our hotels and our kids uh, had no choice. They had to intern in our hotels. So they picked it up at an early age. But I don't think that's actually that important. What is very important, and I've tried to do that within Singapore Management University, is that most business schools are excellent in training professional managers. But, but in family businesses, you have whole grouping of people who are going who need to become what I would call professional owners. They need to know what, what is needed in order to be a responsible custodian of a business. The fundamentals of being able to read a balance sheet, to understand strategy, to understand what are the strengths and weaknesses of family businesses, so that as a family business progresses, you actually can divide uh, management from ownership so that a family business over time can in fact engage professional managers and you may have quite a number of family members who are not engaged in day-to-day -day management of the business. And as Caroline herself said, she was completely involved and now maybe getting a little bit less involved and always on the board, may pursue other interests and so on. But always it's important to have family members who are not necessarily full-time employees of the company to really understand what it means to be a, what I would call a professional owner and business schools are not doing enough of that. When you look at how many, and we all know these numbers, right? 90% of all the businesses in the world are actually family businesses, et cetera, et cetera. But we are rolling out Harvard MBAs who are all taught how to run a multi-billion dollar dispersed shareholding company. What about all the thousands of people who are members of a family business who will inherit it partially as a family they need to know what it means to be a professional owner. And that's very different attributes than being a professional manager. And I think more and more business schools should gravitate towards this type of teaching for members of a business family. Caroline, there's a specific question for you here from the audience. When you were, how did you navigate the transition of the company culture after your father's leadership? What were some of the first main challenges that you that you faced when you joined, you joined the company? Yeah, so 
and it was a it was an interesting experience because as you can imagine i was it's a very male dominated industry so i was the first uh, female leader in in our family and within the industry i was almost the only woman whatever i went to events i was the only woman there it's all male managers um so but what i think has helped me or what i know that helped me and i got a lot of comments from from uh, my employees was that by value and by culture, I'm very similar to my dad, right? So I think the people saw, okay, there's now a young woman, she's woman, she's a female, she came from the US, she's never been in the business, yet she represents the values and the culture that we know from the generations before. And, and that, that somehow gave people the trust in me that, uh, okay, she does it differently, she has a completely different leadership style than her father, but it's actually, it worked out well. And when I, um, and I think people enjoyed the fact that there is, is a mixed management team uh, because I do things differently. So when I, when I looked for, uh, for my follower, for my succession as CFO, there was from people who I would have never expected it, there was actually the, uh, the request to, to hire a woman for that role. And in the end, it turned out to be, uh, to be a man because uh, he was better suited in that sense. But we were keeping it open until the very last uh, selection process. So, so I think the fact that I was a woman did not stop me. Um, and it, it, I, got, uh, yeah, I got a lot of positive feedback from, from the employees. Fantastic. You were surely thrown into it, and now it's, uh, it's up to your brother to run it, and you need to keep your arms distance, but still being involved. I know it's a very Absolutely. fascinating Absolutely. story. Absolutely. Get some it's, femininity in there. <laughs> to see that. There's, an, there's another question here, and it comes a bit with this uh, renewal and the theme of today. How do you best combine family members, I mean, internal talent, some of them young, full of energy, some of the senior aspects, or some of them lacking experience? With external experience and know-how, how do you how do you balance that? And maybe also when we talk about renewal coming out of this pandemic, how much should you bring in external expertise? Because it could be full of conflicts, but it could also add to it. What's your perspective on that? Yeah, if, if I can comment indeed also over the last years and speaking about governance, uh, in our supervisory board, we have two family members, but also by now three external members uh, uh, from the industry. And also these we uh, we renew every, let's say, eight years. And also that has brought us a lot. Uh, and it's not just that they're advisors and I say, okay, thanks for your advice, but I'm not listening to you. No, they really make an impact and they can really uh, give me a hard time and it really uh, keeps me sharp. So uh, uh, I, think, I think that's very important indeed to have these in, uh, external um, uh, outside of the family uh, people keep you sharp. How would you do it, Caroline? I mean, you, you were thrown into it. You had a very good run for six years. Your brother's in it. You, you went on to create the advisory board. And how do you infuse, do you infuse in external talent? And, and what, are your, what are your considerations on that front to, to keep it fresh yeah. and new? And... So that is one of our biggest challenges to actually attract talent since it's such an old, uh, old industry. Um, this, this is uh, on our mind quite a bit, right? Because you need to attract talent, especially when you think of digitization, you need to, to get experts in uh, to, to actually uh, uh, change the business model, which we will have to do, right? Because we have also, when you look at the CO2 emission of an iron foundry, we also know that we need to do a lot with sustainability and automating our processes. Um, and that is that is a big uh, big issue for us. I mean, when now we are, we are lucky with our management uh, team that we found uh, people who are on the one hand side very down to earth, very grounded, so they, they actually fit our culture very well, yet they are also very open and, and innovative and, uh, and very resilient, which uh, has been a great asset now in the, in the pandemic. But it is, I, we haven't found the, the best solution. I think it's really about promoting the company and promoting the, the family style, how we lead the company, because that's, that can be an asset for, for external managers as well, because the, decision, the decisions are done very quickly. Uh, it's not hierarchical, at least not in the size we are in, and it's a very trustful relationship we have with them. So I think for the coming in as an external manager, you, and you have a lot of impact, right? Because you're working directly with the owner and, and the shareholders. So I think those are the, the, the advantages you need to stress when you're looking for, for new talent. But I'm not saying it's, it's not easy for us, <laughs> definitely not. 
Okay, Katie, how does it work in your case? Because, I mean, you still have a very active role, and I know you are a busy man with a lot of things under your belt, your children coming in, but also the pandemic, and of course, the, the need for renewal all the time. You've seen it before. How do you reconcile and how do you work with all these forces and drivers and contrasting? On, 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 the, external, on the external manager side, obviously, the, the nature of my business requires a lot of external professional management. It's relatively easy because the global hospitality industry is so huge. So you can actually get a lot of professionals. I like can get a professional banker relatively easy. You can get a professional uh, hoteliers yeah. relatively easily. So external talent isn't so much the issue. Um, I, before I go on the issue about my own succession, I think the, the earlier question you had about uh, getting younger, how, when do you start in, in do, uh, sort of getting younger members of a business family understand the business? Um, one point that I recognized with that question was that I think actually it's very important because in my own case and the case of many others, we actually prefer our children not to come straight into the business. We mm -hmm. actually prefer them after university and so on to go and work outside, not only for the experience, but very importantly, for them to have a sense of self-confidence that if they didn't want to, they could actually have a pretty good career of their own outside. And that when they join the business, they join the family business, it's not because it's handed to them on a plate and they would be failures otherwise. They can honestly say to themselves, I actually could be quite successful outside. I chose instead to come to the family business. And because of that, you do need to get the children when they're actually young in their teens and so on to understand enough of the business so that they, there's a feeling for it. There's an emotional connection, although not a detailed business understanding, there's an emotional connection mm -hmm. So that when they spend their five, seven years outside the, the family business, they still have an emotional connection so that later on, they may still want to come back to the family business. If you don't build that emotional connection at a relatively early, early age, then they may just say, I prefer to work in such and such a bank or work in such and such management consultancy. And the family business means nothing to me. So I think that's quite important. As for my own case, I mean, it's again, the, I've got one son uh, heading up one listed company. I've got one, one daughter in the hospitality business. I've got one and the younger son who's now uh, finishing his, his studies. Um, they, my, my eldest son, who is now uh, 38, is actually completely the CEO of the company. Uh, I'm actually behaving more like a non-executive chairman um, for all that it means. For Banyan Tree, which I started, I. It's, it's hard to distance yourself from it when you start a business, but I'm gradually beginning to, and, and you build mechanisms whereby, for example, I used to chair the executive committee. Now the executive committee meets without me and we call Exco one and Exco two. Exco one is the executive committee meeting without me. Uh, and Exco two is after they've done and made up all their decisions, they then meet with me and tell me what they've decided. So in a way I have a bit of a veto right uh, and you can't help that, right? Because you build up the company, but you make sure you don't get involved in operating discussions because it's a tendency for a founder to be dominating and dominant. And, and you have to consciously pull yourself from that. So that's one of the things we've instituted already. Fantastic. We have to close up. We have, we have one minute to go here. Maybe just a closing remark. Any, any advice to the audience here, Jerome and Caroline? Just one thing, if they are seeking to renew getting out of the pandemic or on a safe footing, what would be your single piece of advice? Just very short here in the closing mark. One single piece of advice, <laughs> that's a hard one. <laughs> uh, that's how we simplify things at business school, you know that. <laughs> I think, uh, I, I th I think yeah, sorry, I think sh share, the, share the pride of your family company yeah? and, 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 and share this story and share how special it is. Yeah, and I would add, be authentic, be an authentic leader, because this is one of the uh, the strength of being a family business, right? Be be authentic and and as you said, bring across uh, uh, the the advantages of working and uh, being impactful in a family business. Yeah, but be on the edge, right? You always you always need to that. Even for us in a slow moving industry, we need to create a sense of urgency all the time, right? So people stay on. Uh, the tip of their toes and are ready for change at any moment. That's how mm -hmm. I would say how this is the new normal for us, at least. Agility and authenticity. Jerome, very briefly. Andy, uh, like I said, uh, 
uh, uh, uh, spread this uh, pride of the company and and show how how important it is. And I think also in these times, and I'm I'm saying it all the time, uh, because of the long history of of, of our uh, company, we can put things much better in perspective. Uh, like even these last months, hopefully of of the pandemic, you know, we will get through it. You know, uh, look at this bigger perspective. Fantastic. I wish we had more time, but we're gonna we're gonna terminate it here. We're gonna finish the business panel. Caroline, Quanping, and Deron, thanks so much for being on the on the inside the business panel. I'm sure we will learn from you in the future. I think we got a lot of good nuggets here uh, in this very uh, brief session here. Thanks for joining us, and uh, we'll uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks so much. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Keep in touch.